Parth man here. Today I want to talk about impedance matching and I'd like to show how you can use the nano VNA or any VNA for that matter to validate your designs to ensure that you have the correct impedance transformation from the input side to the transistor side. So in a configuration like this I'm using a conventional transformer here and we have three turns so the turns ratio is three to calculate the impedance ratio you just take three squared so it's nine to one and I'm going from a high impedance which is on the input side of 50 ohms to low impedance on the output side which is basically the input impedance of the transistor and I'm using a potentiometer there to simulate that impedance so let's take a look at the specification. I'm using two devices in this board. I use the BLF188XR, and then I also use equivalent uh, NXP part. You can see the part number there. It's the MRF series. So NXP does a good job of publishing their impedances. Let me just zoom in on this chart. You can see there's a whole wide range of frequencies listed here, and it gives you the input impedance and the output impedance. Now, one thing that's important to note here is that this is the input impedance for a push-pull amplifier, okay? And push-pull amplifiers are balanced designs. So how do we know that? When you take a look at the drawing here, it shows the input matching circuit and it shows the output matching circuit here okay and then you see these two arrows on the output side you see these two arrows on the input side that means that the input is balanced and the output is balanced so I'm going to explain a little bit more about that but basically if, if we look at just some schematics it'll give you a pretty good idea okay this is a one transistor final RF output amplifier, something you might find in a CB radio, for example. This just has a single transistor, okay? So this is a single-ended output. This would be unbalanced, okay? Now let's take a look and compare that to a push-pull design, okay? Push-pull design has an input transformer, so the input side of this transformer is unbalanced, but it splits the output side, okay? In the output, you have a balanced signal. So you'll have a signal here, and you'll have a signal there. So I'm gonna go ahead and explain that a little bit more and show how a transformer behaves on the oscilloscope so you have a better understanding of that. But for now, I wanna talk about the impedance of the transistor. So if we take a look at this chart, I said that's my two meter board, so we're at 144 megahertz, and here's the input impedance. So you see 1.6 ohms, and then plus J, 5 ohms. Okay, this is called a complex impedance. It has a real part, which is the resistance, and it has an imaginary part, which is the reactance. Okay, and you see we use J for the imaginary part, and we have either plus or minus. So if you look at a Smith chart, the top half of the Smith chart is the positive side. The lower half is the negative side, okay? Also, the positive half of the Smith chart is inductive, and the negative half is capacitive. So you're going to see a lot of pluses and minuses in this impedance data, and that's what that means. The output is either inductive or capacitive. Where does the inductance come from? If you ever looked inside an LD-MOS transistor, either a BLF series or MRF series on the gate side and the drain side, you're going to see a lot of wire bonds that actually go to the tabs of, of the device. And those short pieces of gold wire add a lot of inductance to the devices. So it has to do with the mechanical instruction, um, also the construction of the die. So that's where these impedances come from where we have some some that are capacitive some that are inductive right and we also have parasitic effects 
on the board as well. You'll have some parasitic capacitance and parasitic inductance, but typically you tune that out. So we're going to talk more about that. So let's take a good close look and we see at 144 megahertz, okay, here's our real part, here's our imaginary part. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, we want to be able to convert this into, into Z, Z magnitude. So we know the impedance as a real number, okay? So we can convert that by basically calculating the correct value. So let me go over to my computer here. And I have a spreadsheet, okay? And this spreadsheet is used to, to convert a complex impedance into a simple impedance, okay? So how do we do that? Well, you see the formula up here, all right? We take the square root of the sum of the squares, okay? So what does that mean? We take the resistance, we square that. That was 1.6. We take the reactance, okay, and again, that can be plus or minus, okay? So in this case, it was plus, and that was 5 ohms. We square that, and then we add the two together, and we take the square root. So here we have our 1.5 ohms. I square that, okay? Here we have our 5 ohms. I square that, and I take the square root of the sum of the squares, and I come up with 5.2 ohms, okay? So you can see that we've converted a complex impedance into a number that we can use to design our impedance matching circuit. So again, very simple, square root of the sum of the squares. I just programmed the spreadsheet. If, if you take a look at this, okay, I just programmed the Excel spreadsheet. You can see I square one, I square the other, I add them together and then I take the square root. So that's the formula. I'll leave that there. It's nice. I, I built a number of Excel calculators. Um, I've lost count how many, but it's just convenient when you have to do calculations. Just plug the numbers in and it gives you the results. So, so here, if we have 5.2 ohms, okay, and we, we divide 50 by 5.2, okay, it's very simple. We're going to get a ratio of 9.5 okay so basically what did we say a conventional transformer has three turns if we square three we get nine so it's a nine to one okay and in actuality it's about 9.5 to one so so very close it's a very close match and then if i take 5.2 times 9.5 i'm going to get close to 50 50 ohms or so so it's very close. So that's what we do there to determine what the input impedance is. And then if we go back to the board here, you can see I'm just using a 10 ohm potentiometer, okay? And I set the resistance and I use that to take measurements on my board with the Nano VNA. I'm gonna explain that um, as, we, as we go along here. So next I wanna take a look at balanced versus unbalanced, so the viewers uh, get a better understanding of exactly what that means. All right, so now I'm set up on one of my other benches here. And here we have push-pull amplifier, right, with one LD MOS transistor, which actually has two independent transistors inside. They call that a Gemini pair. They're matched, okay? And we have an input transformer, okay? And the job of the input transformer is to help with the impedance transformation, but also to take the unbalanced signal and convert it to a balanced signal. So what does that mean? Well, if we take a look at this transformer that I have under test, okay, this is basically the transformer I use in my six meter board. Okay, the Teflon wire, okay, which has Three turns is the primary side. And then I'm just using some heavy braided ground wire as my single turn on the secondary side. Okay, so it's three turns to one turn. Again, three squared is nine, so it's a nine to one impedance transformation. 
okay and we go from high impedance which is 50 ohms to low impedance which is the input impedance of the transistor that would be 5.2 ohms as I demonstrated earlier so what does this look like on the scope okay so the first waveform here that's the input side and that's the unbalanced side right so back to the transformer the inputs applied here the scope probe here this goes to ground okay and we have an unbalanced input here okay then if we take a look at the other two channels on the scope okay you see I have one channel connected to the secondary side here and the secondary side here and that corresponds to these two waveforms okay so you can see we went from unbalanced to balanced so now we have two separate outputs and if you look very closely you, you're going to notice that if I, if I move them into one another okay that they're 180 degrees out of face okay so that's that's the job of the input transformer which not only serves to perform the impedance transformation but also serves as a ballum which goes from our unbalanced side to a balanced side and then if we go back to the schematic we can see we're driving each transistor okay when this transistor is on right this sine wave is positive this transistor is off and when this transistor is off this transistor is on okay and the total power is equal to what we have at this point and this point that's where our total input power would come from so I just wanted to explain this a little bit more I've shown it on diagrams but I thought it would be a good idea to actually show what the waveforms look like also you know it's a it's a three to one turns ratio it behaves just like any other transformer so you can see it's stepping down the voltages as well I don't actually have volts per division on the right scales um, but it, it does step down the voltage proportionately um, I just wanted to be able to illustrate clearly on the oscilloscope that that we have a 180 degree phase shift on this balanced signal okay so I hope that I hope that helps I hope that clarifies what we mean when we say unbalanced versus balanced all right so now I'm back and I'm using the now VNA to sweep my board um, as we can see from the charts I'm sweeping from 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz okay and what are we looking at here well I want to focus on three charts the first one is the Smith chart up here second one is return loss we'll explain that for those of you who may not be familiar with that and then the third one would be the SWRs okay so I'm kind of limited on the resolution uh, but we're at 143.5 megahertz call that 144 okay that's where we tuned out the board so very very close and if we take a look at the Smith chart first okay the center of the Smith chart here is 50 ohms okay and you can see that at 144 megahertz we're very very close to 50 in fact it shows at around 52 ohms so very very close to the 50 ohms there and then if we take a look at the return loss okay which is also at 144 megahertz you see the re return loss is over 16 okay and that's that's excellent for for the return loss you have minus 16 db so return loss is basically the reflected power in decibels okay and then we have our swrs here okay and you can see it's very very close to one it's about a 1.2 okay so this is a pretty good match um, 
in, in terms of transforming the impedance. Um, now, now what happens? Let's let's take a look at what happens. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move the pot here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just change the impedance. Sorry, you can see me change the impedance there. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and sweep this again. And let's see the let's see the effect. Okay, so we see our SWRs have have increased. Um, they're about 4.5 now. Okay, and the return loss is only at minus five. Um, and you can see that on the S on the Smith chart that the impedance has changed quite a bit. Um, it, it is now around 15 ohms or so. Incidentally, I'm reading these numbers off of here. Okay, so this shows the series resistance, okay, as we move around the Smith chart. Okay, so we have a huge mismatch there. There's my SWRs, call it 4.5, and yeah, there's my return loss, okay, which is which is barely four. So you can see that when we have it matched properly, and I'll go ahead and readjust that again. I've got this pot marked, so I know pretty much where I'm at. And we can sweep this again. We can see that uh, yeah, the SWRs again, this is our SWR chart, you see it there, okay, um, about 1.2, pretty good match, okay, return loss, better than minus 16, and the series resistance, again, you can see we're very close to that 50 ohm center point there on the Smith chart. So this is a, a properly matched board. This is how you validate it with a, a VNA. Um, to retune this, I made it very simple. Um, I've got an inductor here in series, okay? And by expanding the coils or compressing the coils, I can, I can shift the frequency. In fact, yeah, let's go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna compress the coils down, all right? Took me a little bit of time to get it tuned out, but uh, it's okay. All right, and now we'll go ahead and sweep it again. We'll sweep that again. And we'll see where the frequency lands, okay? We've changed the inductance, so we're obviously gonna change the frequency. Okay, you, you can see the change there on the return loss, so let me just click it there. Again, a little bit of resolution issue here. Trying to get it exact if I can. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. So, so now we're at like 41 megahertz. Okay, so I made it very easy to tune um, just with a single inductor, and I have that in my setup instructions. So achieve to achieve rather a one to one match on your SWRs, you just have to uh, increase or, or decrease the, the width of the coil. So, so that's it. That's how this is properly done. Um, I, I saw a lot of methods on YouTube that, um, well, didn't actually explain this clearly. So I thought I would make a video and, and show how this is done correctly. So RF man, thank you.